Future Hacker Life Path Future. Welcome back, everybody, to Future Hacker. This is the second episode with Boris Smedinov. So, Boris, let's keep going. Sounds great, Maria. Let's do it. Awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. It's said that most mergers and acquisitions, maybe around 70% of them, I think, they end up failing. Do you have any advice for our listeners that are perhaps evaluating selling their businesses and looking for buyers or partner overseas? So how to make this experience more successful, in your opinion? Absolutely, Maria. I'm very happy to talk about that topic. And I think that I separate the success of the transaction, somebody actually being able to buy and somebody being able to sell, willing, able, actually creating a transaction that's mutual from what happens after the transaction, right? And are the buyers ultimately successful with a purchased business? So I think usually the discussion is about the ultimate end result. And there's been different calculations for different markets, different sizes of transactions, from what I understand of how people have considered this outcome. But where I'm going with this is I think that there's definitely an element of risk and art and a science in terms of somebody being able to sell and somebody being able to buy. And that's one exercise that the teams of owners and teams of advisors and teams of professionals are involved in. And that may go smoothly and conclude in a transaction or it might not. Then there's another element of who then is in control. How much have they thought through what they are going to do with an asset they purchased after? And how do they operate it, right? Where a different set of people are involved in that exercise and its success or failure. Where I wanted to highlight the difference is they're connected, obviously. Obviously, something has got to be purchased to then have an opportunity to integrate and include it into one's organization and hopefully make it successful, right? But it's different people, different stakeholders that have a different level of responsibility for those stages. So if a buyer comes in and the seller fully transparently describes its business, and if the buyer doesn't do their proper diligence and doesn't do their work of preparing for what they do with the business next, then that's a problem, right? Then they're taking in more risk as to how they're going to realize the value for which they paid in buying the selling business. And that is where I think that's been one of the big reasons in the past where the buyers either driven by excitement, some say driven by how the sellers have gotten them excited or, or interested by their seller information in actually doing the deal. But then also it's about how thoughtful have the buyers been about what does it mean to their business? What does it mean to their culture? How likely are they going to be able to include this whole large, in many cases, operation and set of people into what is their team? So I think that going from what often fails, we can figure out what often needs to be successful, right? And I think more pre-planning and more understanding of not only the numbers, not only the legal risks and considerations of a deal, but also the organizational and cultural aspects of connecting the end goal and result. What do you want with this business to how are you going to get it for the buyer is what's crucial in ultimately the investment resulting in a successful return for the buyer. So that's on the broad, if you will, longer term question. But on the shorter term question, when somebody is selling their business and they're looking for buyers, 
then it's about also the preparation on their end preparation to be able to explain their business properly explaining why somebody might want to purchase why somebody needs their operations their people their technology or some other valuable aspects of the business or any of the above and of course then when you get into a transaction beyond preparation it's similarly to how we talked about in the previous episode in our previous conversation about having the right people involved the right team involved here it's having the right owners executives advisors such as financial advisors merger and acquisitions consultants lawyers their the legal advisors maybe tax accountants maybe other kinds of advisors involved in the project and then similarly actually also to talking about some of the possible issues and the possible cures to those in early stage businesses it's having a very specific plan how will this business be taken to market taken to buyers how will the conversation evolve or how is it expected to evolve right what what is the strategy and then adding a, a next layer on top of that is obviously when looking for buyers looking for partners overseas that requires a team all around including the owners executives and advisors that who are experienced in dealing with overseas strategics and or financial buyers and who are experienced with dealing and doing business cross border having those folks involved and having those folks very attuned to the process and very attuned to intended end results and making those happen both within the selling team as well as ultimately with the buying team and having having a, a collaboration right obviously every, each side has their perspectives but still requiring a collaboration to make a transaction that is successful great thank you so much for that boris and you know, it's just amazing how There are so many cases in which companies they they do this amazing job when coming to all the legal and financial numbers and all those advisors as much as they can and they end up missing and underestimating the cultural part and the human side of that, right? If you don't mind, I'd like to cover a couple of the industries that you're currently working with. As we saw when we, you know, introduced you, You have experience with some healthcare startups. You're launching Semper 8 Media. You're touching some points here with uh, regenerative medicine, media projects. It's like it's very a really interesting and varied portfolios of companies you're working with and projects you're working with. Can I touch base in a couple of them? Absolutely, absolutely. On the capital side, Uh, this is driven by the experience that i have and some of the folks that are involved or are getting involved in doing deals in doing investments in working with family businesses uh family offices ultra high net worth individuals and making impact where we can add a lot of value and create a lot of value for projects so this is coming from the perspective of what do we already know what do we already do how can we support and where we are experts so there is a quote that i saw recently uh by Simon Sinek who talked it was something along the lines of uh knowing that you're good at something is confidence and thinking that you're better than anybody is arrogance. So that area that I mentioned capital is where I know that I'm very good at what I do and that allows me enough confidence to both forge ahead and look at other ideas and look at other possibilities. And we happen to identify healthcare media as two areas, one to innovate, create new businesses where we see these areas as being able to make a fantastic and tremendous impact on the society we find them very interesting very intellectually stimulating 
healthcare can deal with both body and the mind. Media is what fills up the mind of people with either entertainment or impactful ideas. And so on the healthcare side, we are working with businesses that are growth stage, early stage businesses, and we are working with them as either advisors or co-founders or investors to these enterprises where we see a, a tremendous potential to impact and help human lives, help people live healthier, live better. And we, we find it very intellectually appealing also to understand complicated and solve complicated problems in healthcare, life sciences, biotech. And we also see a lot of economic potential. So that, that's the connection between healthcare and capital. And like I mentioned with media, a healthcare body and mind, I think both perspectives are important for great well-being. And then media in the areas of the mind you mentioned in our previous discussion, the previous episode, of course, the coronavirus pandemic that has impacted so many around the world such that I think people need more motivation. They need more both entertainment and also impactful ideas that can help them be that much more successful in this new world that is emerging now. Uh, according to Canadian press, uh, about 33% of employed Generation Z and millennial professionals reported plans to pursue a new job. Gen Zs wanted to change. Some people were wanted higher compensation, but a lot of them, 31% of millennials were struggling with low morale. So this is according to Canadian press. In the meanwhile, Time reported that about 400,000 jobs were lost to automation in the U.S. from 1990 to 2007. So there's lots of disruption. This disruption is impacting people not only economically, but is impacting their morale. It is impacting how they think about the world. So we, we see a lot of opportunity to help create positive impact and then also, like I said, extend our value creation where on the media side, what we're doing is we have an approach that deals with strong, thought-provoking content that is being generated, created for TV, film, and digital projects. And we currently have a proprietary library of more than 75 projects fit for TV and film. And we're working to grow that into a production company. And then on top of that, looking to connect back to Semperate Health and some of what we're doing with Semperate Media on a project that you mentioned earlier that is a digital platform that is meant to help people with some of the mental health challenges that are happening in the world. So this is a little bit of insight about some of what we're doing, but also some insight into how these things are connected in terms of thinking about where we're good at, where we're experts, and where we know how we're creating impact to spreading our value and competencies to other areas that we think can create even more societal impact. We can be collaborative, thoughtful, and impactful participants. So one specific area that I'm particularly interested that we haven't covered in the podcast yet is uh, around regenerative medicine and the advancements of the using stem cells. Can we get a little deeper into that? What are What's going on today and what are the trends that you see for the future? Yes, absolutely. I think that that area, when we talk about stem cells specifically, and it's an area that I and we've been close to for some period of time now, one that's an exciting one, but I think one that can't be viewed in isolation from some of the bigger picture of what is happening in the world of healthcare and what is happening in the world of preventative medicine and how that impacts regenerative medicine. Here, here's what I mean by that. When I was at the uh, JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in early 2020, before the start of the pandemic, and hearing some of the global leaders, whether it's CEOs of Bayer and Eli Lilly, 
uh, or Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan speak about what they think is happening in the space. Some of the biggest minds in finance and, and healthcare and biotech, when they spoke about the state of the healthcare industry, the impression that an understanding that I received was people are struggling with the fact that we currently don't have healthcare in most places around the world. Uh, what we have is we have sick care. We have a situation where people are being taken care of as best as possible with the best knowledge available at this time for this science we call medicine, which is not a perfect science, which is not math. Not everything is known, not everything connects exactly perfectly, but we are working to cure people when we know that they're sick, when we have their symptoms, and when basically there's already an issue. So I think there's a big trend to, at least there, there was, there, it will continue in my view right after the pandemic is over, is a focus, of tremendous focus, on how are we identifying issues in people's health before they become serious, before people become symptom symptomatic, or before these issues become life-threatening. So as part of that overall trend that we have a lot of interest in, and the trend of longevity, which I understand you've covered in some of your previous episodes, we're very keen on seeing people live longer, live healthier, live much more fulfilling and active lives. And as part of that, there is a big element of prevention, whether it's with habits and wellness and various, let's call it techniques and habit adjustments, or with tracking such as digital health and d digital devices of various kinds, or what we see as the likely possibilities in the future, such as maybe every time people have certain bodily functions that maybe there's tests that are immediately taken by the devices around them, or people being able to provide blood samples very easily, But things like that of, of getting people's information either from digital parameters that are correlated with people's health or actual stool, urine, blood, etc. samples, I think it will, it will come. So then what I'm suggesting is as part of this overall trend of helping people better, faster, how can we get people not to be sick? How can we get people to live longer? How can we cure them as much as possible? But like I mentioned, I don't think it can be talked about or should be talked from my perspective in isolation. There's this trend of regenerative medicine. And in terms of how do we get people to restore the function of their bodies to heal as fast as possible, as effectively as possible, as safely as possible. And as part of that, there have been a lot of discoveries in the last, let's say, 100 years in the field of how our bodies create new cells, create new tissue, create organ tissue. As a lot of folks in healthcare are aware, the body regenerates. There's a cycle to it such that, let's say, the cells of the dermis, the skin, versus the cells of the, some of the internal organs, liver, heart, versus, let's say, the hair, they restore at a different cadence. They, they follow a different cycle in terms of how long it takes for a particular cell to die and then for the replacement to be provided by the body. So very much linked to the theme of longevity, our bodies function as, uh, let's say, a mechanism that some cells die off, others are created and grow to replace them. And at some point, that mechanism starts running into issues, either because of external influence or some gradual deterioration. And somebody like David Sinclair, who is one of the thought leaders in the space of longevity, as he speaks, there's different reasons that people have identified, and, and he thinks of it as an information problem in our cells and deterioration of information that allows us to uh, renew cells. The question then became, could you be helping the body renew, regenerate, regrow faster. And that's where stem cells, I think, came in with regenerative medicine of saying, okay, well, the internal mechanisms, how the body naturally produces new tissue is by having mechanisms that involve 
cells that then recreate themselves or that then turn into other kinds of cells. And wouldn't it be great if we were able to either restart the body's mechanisms of regrowing these cells or put into the organism these cells that have the function of renewing others oh wouldn't it be great if we could take people's own cells from one part of the body and insert it into another part of the body could we take other people's cells because maybe the person whom we're trying to help is in a shape that we don't want to take their cells because they've already been impacted they've already been diseased so can we take a healthy donor cells injected into a person's body and what kind of a regeneration renewal revival could those cells generate and so an area that has been very interesting very promising and now i think there's more interest in stem cells and regenerative medicine now there's this greater knowledge of how they function and i see this as a very interesting part of the overall field of longevity and improving health and turning the system of sick care into truly a system of healthcare maria that's awesome there's so 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 many exciting things to happen when it comes to the future of healthcare uh, a lot of questions for sure but definitely when we finally get to be able to have a true preventive healthcare system instead of i like the the term that you use we have actually today a sick care system that is said it's just going to be amazing and hopefully we'll get to a point that it's actually going to be something inclusive for everybody right boris uh, unfortunately we're getting to the end of our interview i would love to get some final comments regarding any piece of advice that you might have this whole international business experience that you have any piece of advice that you can give our listeners regarding how to navigate all the uncertainties that you are living today in a more successful and you know sustainable and inclusive way to to give some positive impact to our society Uh, absolutely, Marie, and happy to have this conversation with you. I think that it is very important for people to understand as objectively as possible who they are as individuals, as professionals, what are their strengths, how are they able to most impactfully touch others and the world, and where do their interests lie. going forward lies i think thoughtful planning thoughtful understanding of how people need to interact with others to achieve their results and ultimately seeing where they want to get to and building a plan is so important it is a good idea for people to consider there could be a greater synergy of how the things they they like and they do in personal lives how they can help their work how they work support their life enjoyment in this covid world i think it's tougher to segment out one area of life so i think of people thinking of work life synergy and uh, not work life balance i think it's a fruitful exercise certainly has been for me and perhaps it might be a fit for others That's lovely and just the perfect way to end our conversation. Thank you so much, Boris, and thanks everybody for listening. Future Hacker Life Path Future.